Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Lambda School Mini Boot Camp. This is our first episode. So before I jump into teaching you guys, let me introduce myself and let me introduce a little bit about Lambda School. So my name is Deandra Ryan Moss. I'm an instructor here at Lambda School. I worked as a software engineer for several years in the industry, and now I have switched my focus into teaching you awesome guys how to program. So let me talk a little bit about Lambda School. Lambda School is a computer science immersive, which means that our job is to teach you all about computer programming. So our main curriculum is a six month course. It's totally online. We cover tons of topics in web development, uh, front end development, back end development, a number of frameworks. And then we go ahead and jump into a computer science portion where we teach you all about algorithms, um, some object-oriented programming, some Python. So it's a really comprehensive course that covers both really the practical day-to-day -day skills you'll need, but also a little bit of more academic computer science background, making you guys into really well-rounded programmers who are ready to go into the job force. Um, something else that makes Lambda School extremely awesome is the way we approach tuition. So we are a de-risked educational institute, and what that means is that you do not have to pay anything up front if you don't want. So we have an option where you can put zero down up front, and then once you get a full-time software engineering job making over 50K, you pay us back over your first year or your first two years. And the reason we do this is because we're confident in our curriculum, and we want to keep ourselves motivated to get you a job because that's the whole reason you're here. So that is the Lambda, the curriculum. Uh, as I said, it's a six month course full time, or we do offer a uh, part time course in the evening, which is a year long if you're trying to keep up your job and do it on the side. And we start, our main curriculum starts every single month. And then our um, part time curriculum, I believe, starts only a couple times a year. I will, you will have to reach out to our admissions team to get the exact details on that. So if you are interested in applying, please reach out. We love to see that you've done the mini boot camp. Um, that really makes us prioritize you. And oh, where to learn more about Lambda School? I would probably go ahead and go to our website, which is, ooh, I'm gonna get this wrong. It is just lambdaschool.com, exactly what you would think. Um, so that brings us to what is this mini boot camp? Well, this is a totally free mini course. Uh, it's designed to prep our students for the main curriculum. It's also just available for free on the internet if you want to learn a little bit for free. So that's cool. We love learning for free. Um, it'll dive into all sorts of web development topics we're going to cover all the front end topics. Um, we are going to cover a lot of JavaScript, some CSS, some HTML. I'll go over that a little more in a little bit. Um, and really just introduce you guys to everything that you need to know. So that is what Lambda School is. That is what the mini bootcamp is. I'm super excited to have you guys with me so we can talk about these awesome topics. Uh, make sure you are on Slack, by the way. So. I'll be posting resources as we go along tonight in the channel for this lecture. And then at the end, I always take questions from the questions channel. And I love having you guys interact with me. It makes me feel like I'm not just talking to an empty internet. So please utilize Slack. Uh, it's a great resource we make available to make this a little more interactive. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about some web development stuff. So before we go into learning any tools, I wanna just talk high level. What is web development? What is computer programming? What are you guys even getting yourselves into? And then we'll take some time in the second half of the course to go over a couple really basic tools that any developer needs. So let's start with the most general question, which is what is programming? Uh, so programming, I mean, it is a really broad term. It's essentially just writing computer code. So computer code is any type of code that a computer can read. So it can really vary. Um, there are tons of different languages. Uh, different languages have different syntaxes. They have different keywords. Um, they're designed for different purposes. 
So computer programming can be a really broad term. And I still myself learn new things where I'm like, oh, wow, I never even thought about computer programming that way because uh, there are tons of things you can do. So to really think about what it is in the general sense, um, any language is going to be some sort of combination of syntax and keywords. So what that means is that you syntax things like punctuation, symbols, white space, tabs, new lines, um, and keywords, which are specific words that the computer picks up on and says, hey, that means something. Um, and this combination of different punctuation, white space, and keywords, plus customized words and symbols that you add yourself, tells the computer, okay, do something specific. And it's very, very particular. You know, it's, um, you have to be very exact with your syntax, very exact with your keywords, because the computer can't think, it can't get the gist of what you mean. You have to know how to communicate it with directly. So as a new programmer, that level of precision can be a little bit overwhelming, but we'll try and, as we learn different languages and different syntax, we'll try to really get into the details so that you guys know exactly how to talk to the computer. But as a word of warning, as a new programmer, it's really common to be like, why isn't this working? And it turns out that you just have like one bracket out of place because the computers are really fussy about that sort of thing because that is how they understand what you're talking about. So there are tons of different languages. Um, some languages are extremely versatile. Some languages are designed to do one thing in particular. And then even within languages, there are things like frameworks and libraries, which are essentially uh, layers you can put on top of a language to make it do something even more specific. So for example, we're gonna cover JavaScript in this mini bootcamp, which is a web development language. Um, but within JavaScript, there are a million frameworks that you can use to do even more cool specific things with uh, JavaScript, which we do cover in the main curriculum, but not in this course. I just wanted to introduce you to that word framework or library because you might hear it thrown around. Um, so that brings us into what I wanted to talk about next, which is web development. This is specifically a web development bootcamp, um, both our mini bootcamp and that's a big focus of the main Lambda curriculum. So what is web development? Well, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's any type of computer programming that's designed to create content on the web. So the most obvious things that you guys as just internet users interact with is front end web development. So that is what does the page look like? You know, what text is on the screen? What happens when I click a button? Uh, that is all front end web development, and that's exactly what we're going to cover in the mini boot camp. There's also a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes, which is called back end web development. That's more like where does the data go when you create a user? Um, when you pull up your Facebook, how does it know what all your friends have been posting? That's all happening behind the scenes in the database, and that's called back end development. Definitely we'll cover that in the main curriculum, but we won't get a chance to get into that in this mini boot camp. And so web development, front end web development, really has three languages that we deal with. There's HTML, which is what's on this, what is literally on the page. There's CSS, which is how is it styled. And then there's JavaScript, which is how does it function? What happens when you click a button? And we're gonna cover all three of those. So by the end of this course, you're going to know how to put things on a web page, make them look good, and add some extra little magical functionality. So by the end of this course, we will have you make a web app. So that's really cool. Right now, you presumably have no idea how to make a web app, but in three weeks, you could be building one. Pretty enticing, you should keep showing up. So that is web development. Um, and I hope that you guys um, have kind of a basic idea of what we're going to get into. So before we're able to dive into those specific languages, which we'll really start looking at the languages tomorrow, there are a couple of basic tools that every single web developer or every single programmer needs to just be able to even get off the ground. Uh, and the two tools that we're going to talk about today, which are really related, are the commands line and Git. So let's start with the commands line. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and then we can dive in on that. So give me one second.
Okay, so let's talk about the command line. So the command line is the core of how the computer functions. In days of old, before we had user interfaces, the command line is how you actually told the computer to do anything. So um, we don't need to use the computer or the um, command line anymore, but it's there out of sight. And as developers, we need to kind of tap into that secret world um, of the operating system. So if you are using a Mac, it is super easy to get off the ground with the command line. There is an app called Terminal, and it, so here it is. Um, if you are using Windows, um, you will want to open up Command Prompt. That will allow you to use the command line on Windows. If you are on Linux, you should hopefully already know what the command line is. Um, and if you have any questions about how to get the command line up and running, uh, Google it. This is a great rule of thumb in programming in general. So just type in command line and then you're operating. You know, if you're on Windows 10, and I bet the first article that pops up will tell you exactly what you need to do. So, so what is the command line? Um, that's, it's such a hard thing to explain because the command line is basically everything. You know, if I wanted to destroy every single file on my computer, I could do that right now with one command. So that's, this thing is powerful. Um, but I can also do a lot of really simple things like, move through folders or open files, create files. So I like to think about, to start the command line as being kind of like um, a not so user friendly finder window. So if we open up our finder, we can go through file structures and see what files exist. And that's one of the first things you really wanna use, learn to do on the command line. So I am going to go ahead and let me go into a file here. I'll tell you what this command means in just a moment. So bear with me. Um, all right, so I have just opened a full, or I've just essentially gone into a folder called Lambda, which is in my documents. And I also have that folder open in my finder. So let's do just this kind of side-by-side -side comparison of something that we're used to, the finder um, versus the command line. So in the finder, it's all these folders that exist in here are just out in the open for me to see. If I want to see what's in this folder, I have to use a command called ls. So I type in ls and then just enter. And sure enough, Bootstrap, Precourse, and Recursion all pop up and we can see it matches what's in the finder. And bringing this back to the question of what is programming, so LS, you could think of that as being a keyword. It's something that's built in already that the computer knows to recognize and it knows it means something specific, which is list all the files and folders in this. So I now know that there are three folders inside of my Lambda um, directory. And let's say I wanted to open one of them. So if I wanted to go into pre-course in my finder window, I just double click it and I'm in. Um, and now you guys can see all my behind the scenes lesson planning. Uh, let's do that in the terminal. So there is a command called CD, change directory. And CD is followed by the name of a folder. So I'm going to CD into pre-course. And as a note, um, there's a nice little autofill thing that happens. So what I'm doing here is I can just do CD and then press, I did like, press my tab key and it autofills um, files and folders. So that becomes really useful. It saves a lot of time, but just a heads up on that. But anyways, the most important thing is CD, which is a keyword change directory. And then I put the name of the directory. And now I am inside of pre-course. So if I do ls, now we can see all of these files and a couple other folders, exactly the same over here. So that is our starting point for the terminal, cd and ls. It lets us move around and see where we are. So it's kind of one extra step from using just the finder because the finder has this visual interface where we can see everything from the get-go. Over here, we have to actually Type in ls to get our bearings, but it's not too bad when you get used to it. 
Um, one other thing with CD, if we want to go out a directory over here, we just use the backspace and that's nice. And then the sort of go out a directory command is you do CD and then dot dot. So now I am back inside of this link. The directory and notice over here that there it does tell me which directory I'm in so this is the name of my computer um, over here we have the folder I'm in and then just my username here so just to let you know what's what this gibberish is uh, and so that is the most basic piece of using the command line so let's talk about making a directory if I were using um, my finder I would just do new folder. Over here, the command is make directory, mkdir. So you do make directory, and then you have to put a directory name. So I'm going to call this very exciting new folder. And holy cow, wasn't that cool? It just appeared in the finder window because we made a new directory. And then if I do ls, if I list over here, I can see it. So we have made a new directory. Let's go in it. Over here, of course, it's going to be empty because we've just made it. Um, so what happens if I want to create a file? Well, there is a command called touch. So I can do touch, um, new file. I'll make it a JavaScript file. And ta-da, a new blank JavaScript file. Um, has appeared. So say I accidentally failed file wrong. It's like, oops, we don't want that second one. So we can, of course, go over here and put this in the trash the way we're used to, but we can do it from the commands line. So that command is called rm for remove. So we do rm and then file name, it's gone. So just a word of warning. I know we're all used to having a trash can where we put it in and if we realize we want it, we can go into the trash bin and get it back out. When you do RM, it is gone forever. So don't RM hastily. Um, it is just gone into the ether, disappeared for good. So if you want to remove something, it, you know, it doesn't prompt you, are you sure? It just gets rid of it. Um, so RM works for files. It can work for directories, but you need a couple extra things, and we're not gonna cover that in this lesson. If you want to Google it, check it out, but when you get into removing directories, there is definitely a danger of accidentally deleting a lot of stuff, so be careful. Um, so this is all I'm going to teach you in terms of the command line today. This is just the tip of the iceberg. The command line is really the most powerful thing there is. Um, I remember, three years ago when I was learning this stuff, thinking like, I'm gonna become this command line wizard and I'm going to understand it deeply and then I will rule the world. And it turns out that that never happened because I just, the more I learned about the command line, the more I realized like, wow, this is such this deep rabbit hole and like what is actually really going on in your computer. But it's really fascinating. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and send you guys this little cheat sheet link in Slack if you guys want to check it out. Definitely feel free to look up more command line stuff. It's pretty interesting. And then I would also just say a little word of warning about the command line. So I mentioned at the beginning that I could delete every single file on my computer with one command. Uh, you can do some really powerful stuff with the command line. So when you are, as you get into your programming career, you will sometimes find yourself stuck and looking for solutions online and people will say, hey, try this in the command line. Uh, it's great to use those online resources, but just be a little bit careful about what you copy and paste into the command line. Make sure it is coming from a good source because you could really mess yourself, mess your computer up if you do crazy stuff with the command line. So treat the command line with the respect it deserves, but also use it and start to, even if you're not programming, even if you're just like, you know, organizing some files for some event you have in your life, create the files using the touch keyword, 
um, start playing with this. It's going to be hard at first because it's new, but it feels really fun. Like you feel like kind of this hacker wizard when you're using it and it becomes way more efficient. Once you get used to it, you're going to wonder why you ever used the finder ever because the command line is great. So that is the command line. Um, and now we are going to switch topics over to Git. So before I talk about what Git is specifically, I want to cover one more high level term that you'll hear a lot, and that is the term code base. So what is a code base? Um, let me start by pulling one up for you. So this is a code base that I will use as an example in a later lesson. It is just a folder with some files in it. So this is a really simple code base. Um, it is a folder with literally just three different files in it. Uh, one thing to notice about it is that all these different files are different languages. We have an HTML file, a JavaScript file, and a CSS file. So that's, I think, a common misconception for new programmers is that a code base should contain only the same types of files. That's definitely not true. Um, another thing is that code bases don't only contain code. So this one is just code files, but code bases can also contain resources like videos or images that might be linked to in our code. Um, they also can be far and usually are far, far more complex than this one. So this is very simple. There's only three files. Uh, usually a production code base, something you'd work with in the industry is going to have hundreds if not thousands of files and folders nested and folders nested in folders they get really complex but to kind of answer this question of what is a code base fundamentally it's a folder that contains files that all work towards some kind of common goal so all these files work together and rely on each other to create some final product. And in web development, it's usually a web page or a web app or possibly a mobile app. So these three files happen to create an extremely simple web page. But something as complicated as Facebook probably has not one but many code bases involved in its creation. Um, or whatever you work with, you'll see tons of code bases. So, um, so this brings us into this question of how do developers work on code bases together? So usually there's going to be a team of developers all working on the same code base. So even if it were just me and one other person trying to work on this awesome web page, uh, let's say that we were each working during the day and we both added some stuff to this index.html file. Well, how does that work? What happens if multiple people are editing the same file at once? Uh, we certainly wouldn't want to limit our development team to, OK, I'm working on it today. You can work on it tomorrow. That's not very useful. And even if we were working on separate files, what happens if I edit the index.html file and my coworker edit, edits the index.js file? How do we get those together? How do we know what the newest version is? Well, there's a really sophisticated answer to this question, and it's called Git. Uh, Git is a tool that's used to allow developers to collaborate in this really sophisticated way. So let me go ahead and show you this cool little diagram about how um, workflow works in the real world. So, what would happen is you would have this master copy of your code base. So there's kind of this like official version of the code base. But say I want to start working on it. Um, chances are I'm going to be playing around with it. I'm going to be editing things. And I might break things along the way. That's usually how it goes. Um, before you get to the point where you improve something, you generally break it a little bit first. So we don't want to affect the master branch because that's what's going live. So I could pull off, I basically create a copy of it, which is my own feature branch. So I create this copy that no one else is really messing with, and I can break it to my heart's content, and then I can fix it and make it better than ever before. But at the same time, maybe my colleague is working on some other feature. So he creates his own copy over here, starts to mess around with things. Maybe his feature is a little simple. Maybe he's just doing a quick bug fix. He finishes out 
what he's doing and then merges it back into the master. So once it's been confirmed that the code he was working on is working, it's doing what it's supposed to, then it goes back into the master branch. And now it is ready to go live. It's ready to be utilized. But meanwhile, I'm over here in my own land, still working on this other feature branch. Um, what this diagram doesn't show is that there is a way for me to actually pull in these changes that my coworker made into my copy. So hopefully this is starting to make sense on a conceptual level, how we have this official version of the code, but then each of us create copies uh, that we work on and change so that we're not messing up the final version. And then once we get the code to the point where it's ready to go, we can put it back into the official master branch. But how logistically does this work? Uh, it wouldn't be very efficient if I literally just you know, went into my finder window and copied and pasted the code base and changed the name a little bit and then edited it. And then how would I know how to put it back when I was done? You know, I couldn't go imagine going file by file and checking what's been changed. That would be awful. That would be beyond awful. That is what Git does for us. Git is this amazing tool that lets us create these copies and then put them back into the master branch without us having to do any of the heavy lifting. So let me show you how Git works. Um, well, it works on the command line, which is why we started with the command line. There are certain Git commands that we use to do all the stuff that I just described here. But before I show you those, let me talk to you about GitHub a little bit. So this is GitHub. This is where code lives. Um, GitHub is a website that hosts a bajillion code bases. So really powerful tools that are being used all over the web are on here, open source. So you can find some really cool code bases that are extremely popular, extremely powerful, and they're just available for free for you to look through or play with on GitHub. So that is one, one thing that GitHub is, is it's a place to actually host all these code bases. And as I said, tons are open source, which means that anyone can use them. Anyone can try and edit them, though your edits won't be accepted unless they're actually good. So that's good because we don't want random people just editing important code bases. Um, it's also a place to host private code bases. So in my old job, for example, we had a web app that we built that was not open source, but we were able to put it on GitHub privately so that all the developers on the team could access it easily. So GitHub is where the code lives. Um, it is not the only site like this. It is the most popular, but there are several other of these code base hosting sites like Bitbucket and GitLab. But GitHub is kind of the place you want to be. So that brings us to a very important thing we're going to do right now, which is create our GitHub names. You will absolutely 100% need a GitHub account for this course and for being a developer. So please do this right now um, or do it immediately after the lesson. Go to github.com, make sure you pick a professional username because your GitHub is also a portfolio for all the code that you've been working with. And six months from now when you're applying for developer jobs, people are gonna be looking at this. So pick a username, put your email in, create a password, sign up. And I will go ahead and just sign in because I already have a GitHub. Cool, so once you've created that account, uh, you'll have your own page and it'll show you everything that you've worked on. Uh, right now it should be pretty sparse because you are just beginning. Um, later after this class, I would go ahead and add a picture and create your profile and all of that fun stuff. But for now, let's just talk about what we're going to do on GitHub. So I mentioned that there are lots of code bases being hosted on this site. One of them, which is very relevant to you, is Lambda School's pre-course code base. So I am going to go ahead and paste that in the lesson channel. So that is on Slack for you guys. Uh, it's pretty easy to find though, just GitHub slash Lambda School slash pre-course. So all of your homework, for the entire course is going to be in here. So this is pretty important, as well as little summaries of what we'll do in every single class. So for example, over here in lesson one, 
we have a nice little summary of what I'm talking about today. So look at that, all of that fun terminal stuff we covered is here, as well as some Git things that we are about to cover. And then at the very bottom, we always have some links for further reading. Um, we have some homework assignments, though the homework for tonight is pretty simple. So. So yes, this is a very important place for you guys who are taking this mini boot camp. So make sure that you go ahead and go here. So right now this code base exists online. So through GitHub, we can look at all the folders, all the files, but if we're going to be using it, we wanna create a local copy. So this is the first Git thing that we are going to do together, and it is called cloning. So when I was showing you this, diagram over here, I talked about the first step being create a copy for yourself. So the first place that you want to create a copy is a, an online copy, a remote copy on GitHub. So right now, this code base belongs to Lambda School, who is a user on GitHub. But I want a copy that belongs to me. So what I do is fork. So the term fork means create a copy that now belongs to my user. So if I fork this, um, it's telling me I already have a fork of this repository, because I do. But uh, you guys presumably don't, so go ahead and fork it. And then now I go over here, and we can see down here that it says forked from Lambda School slash pre-course, which means forked from a copy that belonged to Lambda School. But now I have a copy that belongs to me, D. Ryan Moss. So there are now two copies of this code base on GitHub. There are actually a lot more, but we'll just say there are two. One that belongs to Lambda School, one that belongs to me. Totally separate copies. So now I've created my own copy online in this remote space using Fork, but I want a local copy. I want something that I can use on my computer because I can't very well edit any of these files when they're just floating on GitHub. So that brings us to our very first git command. So all of these commands that we use so far, like rm, touch, ls, are all built into the terminal. But there are also git commands, which aren't necessarily available. So before we use them, we have to make sure we can. So I would start by just typing in git. And it, what it did is it said, OK, here's a giant list of all these things I can do with git. That means that git is available to me. I can do git commands. But you might have gotten something like, oh, what's git, or not available to you. Um, so git should automatically be available to you on a Mac. You might need to install Xcode, uh, and it should just prompt you for that. So if you're having any problems getting git to work on a Mac, go ahead and reach out in the help channel. In terms of Windows, uh, I don't believe that it is automatically available. So I think I have right here, Git for Windows. This will tell you exactly what to do to Git Git on Windows. Um, and look at this, Git for Linux. So there are some things in Slack that should help you get off the ground with Git in case you are on a Windows or a Linux machine. So hopefully you guys can catch up with that. I am going to go ahead and keep going with this. If you can't quite get it installed yet, that's OK. This is going to be on YouTube. You can come back and follow along afterwards. But let me go ahead and start to actually do some fun Git stuff. So back to where we were. We had forked a copy, which means that now I have my own personal copy of this code base existing remotely on GitHub, but I want a local copy. So I am in this new folder that I created, and I'm going to go ahead and clone git. So the command for that is git clone. Both of these are built-in commands that tell the terminal what I want to do. And then there's this link. It's actually the same link as up there. But there's a link to the repository. And which, by the way, repository just means code base. Uh, you'll hear repo or repository. That just means a code base on GitHub. So here is a link to the repo. 
we're cloning, that means that a local copy was just pulled down. So if I do ls, I can see there's now a pre-course folder. I'm gonna go ahead and cd into that. And now all of these files, all these folders up here, exist locally on my machine. And just as a reminder for the analog, I can see that over here in Finder, pre-course has appeared, and I have this whole code base available locally. So if I wanted to go to a remote hut in the mountains and work on my pre-course stuff, it now exists locally. So I have full access to hard copies of it on my machine. So that's nice. So that is, we have now forked, which means create a copy remotely, and then cloned, which means create a copy locally. Those are two Git tools that will help us get started. So now that we have a local copy, we can start to make changes to it. So let's go ahead and make a directory. So right now there are 12 lessons, but I think there should be 13. So I'm gonna do lesson 13, destroy everything with terminal. You guys definitely need to know this as beginners. So I went ahead and created this very long named folder called lesson 13, destroy everything with terminal. Um, that exists in here now. So now the local copy is different than that original copy. So in our little diagram here, we've created this copy and now we're starting to make changes to it. So as you might imagine, we need to save these changes somehow. There are two different steps to what you'd think of as saving in Git. The first thing is adding. So if we do git status, which is a great command, you will use git status all the time. It tells us, oh, okay, I think I might need to create a file before it tells us anything interesting. So, um, all right. So let's go ahead and create a new file here. So the command for that was touch. So touch, destroy everything.js. Now we have destroy everything.js. I accidentally did not put it in the folder it belongs. I'll use this as a chance to teach you one more command then, mv, move. So I'm going to move destroy everything.js into this lesson 13 folder. So mv for move, the file I want to move, and then the folder I want to move it into. So now if I cd into lesson 13 and do ls again, I can see that there's this destroy everything.js file. And just to do that over here, because I know you guys are getting used to the terminal still, I have gone ahead and moved this destroy everything file into my destroy everything folder. Okay, so now let's do get status. I went ahead and cd dot dot out to my main directory. You generally want to be in the main directory. And it tells me there is an untracked file. This folder is untracked. That means that it hasn't been saved, basically. So the first thing we do when we want to save it is get add. So we can do get add dot, which means add everything that's new. Or we could do get add lesson 13, and that's specifically saying add everything from this new folder. So when I say add, it basically means queue it up. So we haven't really saved it yet, but it's kind of in the queue to be saved. And if I do get status now, this file that was red before is now green. It's saying this has been, it's uh, to be committed. So it's staged for commitment. It hasn't been saved yet. Um, as you might guess, the word we use for saving in Git is called commit. So commit means we're actually committing to this being in our um, code base. And you really only want to commit when you've actually done something that you're feeling pretty good about. So if, you've, if you're at a good stopping point um, with whatever you're working on, you want to commit. If you're right in the middle of something and it's still broken, don't commit it. So I will commit this. So git commit is our command. And then I do a dash M, which is a message. 
and we want to add a specific message. So I'll say created new JS file. That's actually not that specific of a message, but since there's nothing interesting in it, that's the best we can do. So I went ahead and committed it. And this is a good opportunity to take a pause and remember how important syntax is. So I have this keyword git, this keyword commit, this dash m flag, which tells it, all right, I'm adding a message and then in quotes, the actual message. If anything were off here, if the dash were missing, if commit were spelled wrong, if we left off the quotes, things would not go right. This has to be really precise. And I know that you guys are probably like, why are you throwing so many things at me right now? You're not expected to memorize all this. Um, we have lots of resources available. There are tons of places online where you can look at what these commands are. You don't need to have them memorized yet. And in fact, it's not expected that you do it all. So just understand the gist of, all right, we're doing these git commands in terminal, and what do they mean? This commit means we're actually making a save to our code base. So that is git commit. So now we have saved this change. But even though git and commit and add are super important and probably the two things we do the most in git, I will admit to you that we've kind of committed a faux pas, which is our branch. So all these things have been committed onto the master branch. We can tell because it says, master over here. That is not good because the master should be the untouchable thing. The master should, you never even really edit the master directly. You just change things over here and then push them back into the master. So I wanted to just introduce you to adding and committing, but now let me add branching into this process because this becomes really important. So I have this master branch, which is kind of like the final version but whenever I want to start working on a feature, I need to create a new branch. So how we do that is we go git checkout B. So we're saying git checkout new branch, and then we create a branch name. And so that is called, you know, I could say, um, we're destroying everything, right? Destroy everything. And now I'm on a new branch and I can edit things on there and then I can merge them back in. Admittedly, branching is a little bit more advanced. It's extremely critical when you're in an actual production environment, but for the sake of you guys working on your pre-course, I don't want you to worry about branching. So I did want to introduce it because it is a really important part of what makes this so powerful is this idea of breaking off branches and then pushing them back into the master. But for now, don't actually worry about checking out new branches when you're going through and working on this. You can work off of master for pre-course. And because it's your own copy of master, it won't affect the master, master version that everyone's using. But I just wanted to make you aware about branching. And that's something, of course, that you'll learn a lot more about in our main Lambda curriculum. So this tells us everything that we need to kind of get off the ground. Um, but we have one more step. So let me go back to master. So now I am back on my master branch. As we know, we've changed a couple things, right? We've added this awesome new folder. We've added this awesome new file, but only locally. Everything we've just worked on only happened locally. So what if we want to make changes on GitHub on the remote repository? So we do something called pushing. Pushing in Git is where we take everything that we've done locally and we push it up to the remote version. This is usually done, this is a good thing to do at the end of your workday, once you become a developer. Uh, you don't want things to just exist locally because if something happened to your machine, then it's gone and that would be tragic. So we always wanna push when we've done some big change, like created this destroy everything blank JS file that I slaved all day to write. So I wanna push this remotely. So what I do is I go git push origin master. This is essentially saying push this back to the original master branch. 
Uh, for right now, this will always be the command that you use to push. As you get a little more sophisticated in your Git usage, this might change a little bit. But for now, Git push origin master. So this is pushing that file back up online. And sometimes it will prompt you for your, uh, depending on how you have it set up, sometimes it'll prompt you for your Git password when you do this. Um, I have it set to just do it. So now let's go back to GitHub. And if I refresh this page to my copy of pre-course, there it is. It now exists online. We have this destroy everything JS file inside of this new folder. So we have successfully pushed. Our changes are online. They're safely stored on GitHub. And then finally, what if I am like, well, the world needs to know how to destroy everything. I need this to go back into that original um, master branch. So if I go back to Lambda Precourse, I can do something called a pull request. So a pull request is a request to make my changes officially in the new master branch. So I can go ahead and do new pull request. And I don't know. I think I have to go to my pre course. Yeah, okay. So I go to my copy of pre-course. Um, it's saying that the base fork is Lambda pre-course. The head fork is mine, which means I'm trying to push this back into the master. And then I can go ahead and do create pull request, which submits to Lambda school and says, hey, go ahead and review this and tell me if it's any good or not. So I'm not gonna click this because I don't actually want this silly new folder in my um, in the Lambda School pre-course, but when you're doing your homework, you will create a new pull request, which is our way of kind of checking your homework and making sure you've done what you're supposed to do. So that is everything I wanted to cover today. Uh, just to review, we've gone over what the terminal is. The terminal is our extremely powerful way of interacting with our computer. We learn to do kind of basic finder tasks like move around folders, see what files are in folders, create new files, create new folders, remove files. But as I mentioned, this is so powerful and you can really tap into all the secrets of what your computer is doing with the command line if you know what you're doing. But if you don't know what you're doing, you shouldn't just put random commands in here because bad things could happen. So we talked about the terminal. And then we talked about workflow, which is how developers work together on projects and use this awesome tool called Git. And you learned a little bit about GitHub, which is this place where all these crazy repositories live. There's so much cool code on GitHub. GitHub like never ceases to fascinate me because it's amazing to me that we have this like community library of all this amazing code that we can use on GitHub. Um, and you learned through GitHub how to fork a copy of a repository, how to clone that down to your computer, how to make changes, add those, commit those, push them back up, and then finally make a pull request. So, and I do have this Git cheat sheet for you guys, which I'm also going to post in Slack. So once again, we do not expect you to memorize all these commands. Use your cheat sheets. You'll memorize these soon enough. So one final thing I wanted to show you guys with Git is I love XKCD and there is this amazing comic which I will also share in Slack about how Git is an extremely powerful tool that so many of us don't really know how to use. So I would recommend that you really master Git because I found in my job that I was one of the most proficient people and actually knowing how Git works and that made me everybody's best friend, which maybe is bad, right? I guess don't get good at Git if you don't wanna be hassled by your coworkers, but it looks really good when you know how to use Git. So yeah, as you go ahead and learn how to be a better and better programmer, you're gonna find that there's all sorts of cool, crazy things you can do with Git. So we have really covered two amazingly powerful tools today, but only scratched the surface on them. So today, 
Um, your homework is very simple. We want you to get Git installed on your computer, which might have already happened during this lesson. We want you to create a GitHub account, which also might have already happened if you were following along. Uh, fork and clone the repo. Add a new file. Make some so make some changes. Um, add commit and push your change. Submit a pull request, and that's it. So everything I just did for you guys, uh, you need to do for yourself in the homework. So if you're following along, you are done with the homework. And just as a word of reminder, I did briefly mention branches. You don't have to do branches, so don't sweat that. Uh, we are available on Slack for you guys, so if you get stuck in this process, definitely reach out, especially if you're trying to install something like Git. If you get stuck, don't just keep copying and pasting random things in the terminal. You'll dig yourself in a hole. If you're stuck, reach out. We will help. We are glad to help. Uh, and if you guys have any questions right now, we have about 10 minutes left. So let me open up the questions channel and I will address anything that you guys want to know right now. Okay, so let me, okay, Monica asked, what is the difference between add and commit? Which is a good question because we're used to saving, which kind of, um, Saving is like one step, and adding and committing breaks saving up into two different steps. So let me get my terminal up again. So basically, think about it as like, if you're thinking about committing as marriage, um, adding is like getting engaged. You're like expressing intent. So if I go ahead and create a new file here, and I say get add new file, I'm basically telling, um, I'm telling the computer, I think I wanna add this new file. I'm pretty sure I wanna add this new file. And it's, it's saved, but it's not like super saved. So if I go ahead and do get status, I can see that it's staged for commit, which means like, yeah, we've got this new file thing. Uh, we're pretty sure we're gonna commit it. But if you decide like, oh crap, new file is full of a million bugs, it's not ready, it's pretty easy to undo an add. So it's kind of this low commitment thing where it's like, all right, I'm thinking about adding this, but I'm not totally sure. Um, if I'm like, no, new file is solid, it's going in, I do get commit, added new file, and now it's saved. You can undo a commit, but it's a lot harder. So whereas you just kind of get add as you go, kind of like a casual saving, you only want to commit when you're really ready to do it. And the big reason for that is that your commits are your way of keeping track of all the changes you've made. So in GitHub, there'll be this list of all the commits you made and you don't want to be committing all the time because then you'd have like 4,000 commits that were like added new line of code, removed new line of code because it broke stuff. So you want to only commit once you feel really confident that something is ready to go in. Okay, next question. Besides Sublime Text and GitHub, what other tools would you suggest for us to get familiar with? Uh, that is a great question. So Sublime Text is a text editor. It's the one I use. There are definitely other good text editors that are free. Uh, Atom is one that's popular, uh, VS Code. I think I'm gonna talk a little more about these tomorrow. But any text, and then there are a bunch of really powerful text editors that you have to buy that have lots of cool things where you can like see how code connects. Um, personally, I don't really find those that helpful. I kind of like the bare bones text editors, but you're, if you're interested in trying, you know, Googling around and trying a free trial on some of the more advanced ones, but honestly, I would say stick with one text editor and GitHub right now. Make sure you master what you're using before you start to branch out and try everything. I think this is very much a quality over quantity thing. It's much better to really master one text editor than to try all of them. And it turns out that the text editors, even something free like Sublime has lots of cool customization you can do. So if you're bored tonight, I would maybe look up some YouTube videos on Sublime or find some blog articles and find out some of the cool things you can do with Sublime Text. All right, any other questions out there?
I'll give you guys one more one more second to ask. Oh yeah, Brittany asked that I learned to code three. Yes, yeah, she said um, that I mentioned I learned to code three years ago, and she wants to know if I attended Lambda School as well. I actually didn't. I don't believe that Lambda School existed when I got into software engineering. Um, actually, let me go ahead and switch back to not screen sharing so I can see you guys, or you can see me. Hey guys. So my background is in mathematics. Uh, I have a math degree and during my mathematics education, I did a little bit of coding. I got a research grant where I was writing uh, some software to basically estimate unsolvable integrals to like extremely precise degrees. So not at all what I ended up doing as a web developer, but it was enough to tell me that I really like to code. So when I finished my math degree uh, and decided that I didn't want to continue in academia, I heard about these coding boot camps. So I actually attended a different coding boot camp in Austin, Texas. But and I, I will say that I'm really excited about Lambda and seeing all the cool things that Lambda does. And it's great to be behind the scenes because I know a bunch of things that I didn't like that my coding boot camp did. And now I have the power to actually change them in Lambda school. Uh, so, and a lot of the people who work here, some of them actually went to coding boot camp with me. Some of them went to other boot camps. So we all have really good insight about what it feels like to be you. So we're working to try and give you guys the experience that we wish we had had. Though my experience was really good too. So, um, Aaron asks if the mini boot camp would be similar to the real course in style and whatnot. Yes and no. Um, I mean, in the basic sense of being online and using Slack, but I think that the real course is a lot more personal in that you have a class, you have people that you're working with day in and day out, and we do blend lectures with teamwork. So whereas you guys are welcome to interact with each other in Slack, and we really actually encourage you to interact with each other in Slack and get to know each other and use each other as resources, uh, that's a lot more explicit in the main course. Um, in that we electronically, we use a software called Zoom, which is kind of this conferencing software to actually split you guys up into groups so that you are working together. Um, and then as well as having lectures and teamwork time, we also have set homework time. So those hours that the course run aren't hours you're being taught, you're not being lectured at for eight hours a day. It's a blend of lectures, teamworks, time for you to do your homework. And then in general, it's also just going to be a lot more comprehensive, um, a lot more of a commitment, a lot more of like, this is the only thing I'm thinking about. I'm dreaming about code. Though someone in the mini boot camp last session did tell me she started having coding dreams. So that's, I think, a good sign. When you're dreaming about computer programming, you're thinking about it. <laughs> All right. Uh, Jesus asks about what's being taught. So he asked, how deep will Lambda go into the material and how proficient will the average graduate be to land a job soon after? So we teach you, we present to you everything you need to know to get a job in the field. What you learn is partially gonna be up to you though. We, our admissions process is all about making sure that we are picking people who we think are really serious about committing to this. And one of the ways we decide you're serious is if you've gone through this mini boot camp. Um, but you know, if you slack off and if you're not putting your work in and if you're letting your teammates do the work for you, you're not going to be ready for the job. Admittedly, we take on that risk because you don't have to pay us. And if you don't work hard in the course and you aren't job ready and you can't get hired, we take on a lot of that burden. You know, you just, you know, you just maybe wasted six months of your life, but we take the financial hit for that. And we think that that's a risk worth taking because we try to pick people we're really confident in, but hopefully you guys won't take that attitude with it. And if you are serious about it and you're doing the work and you're putting the hours in, then you will be at a point where you're ready to get that junior level software development job when you're done. And in fact, this course goes a lot deeper than other boot camps. A lot of boot camps just focus on kind of the 
practical skills of like web development and frameworks and don't even go into computer science topics. So we try and go a little deeper than what's necessary because we want you to be really ready when it's time for job interviews. Um, let's see, we had another question about is Lambda School open to students outside of the US? Uh, there is, there are some complications with our deferred payment program. So we might not be able to do the de-risked education model for you if you're not a US citizen. You're gonna have to talk to the admissions team about the details on that. But if you're able to pay up front, 100% for sure you can join even if you're outside of the US. If you still wanna do deferred payment, reach out to us and we'll look at your specific case and try and find something to make it work because we want to make this open to as many people as possible. Does anyone else have any questions for me? See one more person typing. By the way, thank you for all of these excellent questions. I want to make sure you guys know exactly what you're getting into. So, um, so AV asked, when you get a job, will they provide you with the kind of software that you're familiar with? For example, Sublime Text. It's going to depend company by company. Um, at my job, you could use, I think usually you can use whatever text editor you want. Uh, the job I worked actually provided a free license to a more advanced text editor. So I got to play around with using something a little more sophisticated, which ended up being really useful in some cases. Uh, but I will say that the most important skill to learn as a software engineer is not any specific language. It's the skill of being able to learn new things on the job. Things are really fast paced in this world. They're constantly changing. So whether it's text editor, language, framework, workflow, you need to be prepared to do something that you've never touched before when you get into a job situation. So one thing we try and teach her at Lambda School is not just here's this language, but how do you learn a language? How do you think about something you've never seen before? Because that is like the number one skill of being a software developer. And I can tell you that skill has helped me in a lot of other places in my life. So it's very worthwhile to learn how to jump into something extremely unfamiliar and stay calm until it starts to make sense. Um, all right, we are a little bit past time actually. So I love these questions. I want you to keep asking them. I am going to close out this channel right now, but the Slack channel is still open. Please keep asking questions and discussing. And I will see you guys tomorrow night and we will start to jump into HTML and CSS. So some actual code writing. Okay, I will see you guys tomorrow. Thanks for joining me. Have a great evening.